The views and opinions expressed in the following podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the producers, the affiliates, or digital platforms hosting this podcast. All content is for the purposes of education, conjecture, and at times entertainment. We promote inclusiveness and diversity. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Into the Deep with Jay Casta. Welcome to Into the Deep. I'm Jay Costa. What does it mean that consciousness continues? What is consciousness? For that matter, what is life? What is death? These are just some of the questions that I discuss with today's guest, whom I am delighted to have hosted. She's a linguist, an educator, and a book coach. Today's guest is Lisa Smart. Lisa is the author of Words at the Threshold, What We Say When We're Nearing Death. It's a book based on meticulously researched and data collected through the Final Words Project. It's an ongoing study devoted to gathering and interpreting the mysterious and rich in language patterns that appear to be unique to end of life. Trained in linguistics, Lisa was deeply curious about the language she witnessed during her father's final days. When she discovered little to no research had been done in people's final words, Lisa established the Final Words Project with Dr. Raymond Moody, who originally coined the term near-death experience. Well, that research has led to not only the book, but an ongoing study and project. We talk about so much in this episode, and I just want to dive right in. What happens to consciousness? And what is consciousness, especially when we're on the threshold? So, join me as we seek light and journey into the deep with Lisa Smart. Enjoy. Lisa, thank you so very much for joining me today. Uh, I just really cannot thank you enough for taking the time. No, you're so welcome. That's what this is all about, right? I do my work so I can share it. So I'm really glad to be able to do that. Thank you. Absolutely. So Lisa, for our listeners and our viewers, would you mind sharing who you are and what you do? Wow. (laughs) Um, Let's see, who am I? I think first, I'm a curious person who does research in a variety of ways. Um, I was trained as a linguist and I went to school at Berkeley and I was really blessed to study with some of the best in terms of people in the field of linguistics and cognitive linguistics. Um, And I have been very fortunate to work with Dr. Raymond Moody, who coined the term near-death experience. We've been working together in the last, it's been a decade now since my father passed away, which was the catalyst. So, you know, I would say if I just said that I'm a, a a writer, a teacher. I've been a professor. Right now, I'm doing a lot of writing. I'm, I'm, I'm actually a book coach right now. I'm helping other people get their ideas out into the world, which is really exciting. Um, and I think like Raymond, I work very closely to Raymond, and he's been a big influence on me in so many ways. And one of the things is that Raymond is really um, really committed to inquiry, you know, uh, and just you don't stop asking the questions. And I think that's, that's who I am and where I am is I'm just keep asking questions. And, and it happens to be in the field of consciousness and language. I love that. (laughs) I do. It's wonderful. So you're a, a book coach. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, my God, talk about another honor. Um, you know, people come to me, many of them come through uh, lifeafterlife.com, which is the website that Raymond and I curate. And you know, a lot of people who are also asking many of the questions that Raymond and I have been asking, and many of us do, you know, what does it mean uh, that consciousness continues? What is consciousness? What is life? What is death? <laughs> All those simple questions. And what's for dinner? <laughs> No big deal. Although sometimes what's for dinner is just as complex as all the existential dilemmas of the world. So, yeah. 
<laughs> no kidding, no kidding. Um, so people come to me usually from the website. So they're people who are investigating questions about, um, you know, usually spirituality or uh, personal transformation. In some ways, I'm working with a medical examiner who's asked some very big questions about life and death based on her work and working also with Niels Bohr's granddaughter who really? is a remarkable woman um, who is also asking questions about quantum physics and spirituality and how they intersect with her personal life, being the granddaughter of Nobel Prize winning scientists and so forth. So I'm just, you know, I feel, and I've actually worked with Raymond on his last two books. Um, so it's just an incredible honor to midwife other people's ideas. And so that's um, how I spend a lot of my time. Actually, I'm working also with a couple psychic mediums. Ooh, and nice. a lot. I know it's just, it's, I feel like I get an inside view into how a psychic works. And so I'm finishing a one book for one um, psychic name, whose name is Tracy Escobar. And she's known as the red couch medium because everywhere she goes, she runs into red couches. <laughs> really? Well, I have a red couch in this room, so. <laughs> no kidding. You I really, really oh my I'm... God, this is <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. So I remember you saying that the catalyst uh, for you delving into this subject matter, obviously, um, was the unfortunate passing of your father. So was consciousness or what happens after this dimension that did that ever enter your mind or your being before that? Mm, I think, you know, on a very superficial level, I mean, you know, when Raymond's book came out when I was 17, I remember very distinctly his book, Life After Life, where he coined the term near death experience. And, you know, I remember being 17 and on the, on my rug reading it. So I was intrigued, but I, you know, I was teaching, um, adults uh, and, you know, in English, I mean, I wasn't, I think like many of us, I was curious and, and wanted to know more, but I certainly didn't think it was going to be the cornerstone or such a central part of my life. Um, however, uh, when you see something, as I did with my father, as he was dying, when you see something so powerfully in front of you, um, well, I'll be more concrete. Uh, you know, I was trained in linguistics and, and my work involved language a lot. I worked uh, part, some of what I did is I worked with adults who had problems reading. And so I would try to figure out the puzzle of what was going on with them, um, you know, adults who were dyslexic, because it was mm. always, you know, very oftentimes very bright folks who weren't able to kind of decode the page. So, and that was what I was doing for a living. I really enjoyed my work. Um, but I was always geared towards language and how language reflected thought processes. So um, my father got sick very quickly. I, he he had prostate cancer, but that's a lot of people do and, and make it through okay. But he got an infection um, because they overradiated him. <sighs> And so he got one of those really serious infections that just progressed very quickly. And, and within three weeks, he passed away. But during those three weeks, every day after work, I would sit at his side. And, you know, just being trained as a linguist and being someone who thinks with a pencil in her hand, <laughs> um, as my dad was talking, I just started writing things down because I was really baffled and intrigued by what he was saying. And it had this very sort of mythic and kind of almost poetic quality to it. And um, so, you know, it began um, actually my, my 52nd birthday, which was 10 years ago now. Um, but it began on my birthday and he walked out the front door in his underwear in California on a January night. <clears throat> and when the police stopped him, he said he was headed to bring boxes to the big art show. And that's when I began saying, holy moly, you know, is this just the meds or what's going on here? And I just transcribed, you know, I started transcribing what he wrote. And he started saying things um, 10 days before he died. He said to me, oh, Lisa, there's so much so in sorrow. And it, things like that, which technically are sheer nonsense, but I heard many layers of meaning in those things that were 
supposedly nonsensical. And oftentimes many people dismiss their loved one's language at the end of life as either being just the meds talking or their, you know, whatever. But for me, just because I love language, I just wrote things down. And um, so I was intrigued. And when my father, who was a total uh, skeptic, a matter of fact, I just found this photograph again and I brought it to my desk because I knew we were having this interview. I don't know if you can see it. It's a picture of my dad. Oh. And it was six weeks before he died. Hmm. And he was in Mexico. He didn't know he was going to get sick, right? Because it was three weeks later, he actually got sick. But someone said, hey, Morty, hey, Morty, <laughs> how about drawing, uh, write a word on your hand that tells us something about you. And I want to take a photograph. And he wrote the word visitor. Wow. Yeah. And he said, yeah, I'm just visiting this planet. So, um, but my father, who was kind of existential, and but he certainly was not a believer in God and certainly not in angels. I mean, he was definitely a confirmed atheist. Um, he called himself a gastronomical Jew, which meant that his idea of God was, you know, like a corned beef and rye with slaw on the side, which, you know. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> definitely going back to the dinner conversation that we began with. Him. Uh, you know. <laughs> This seems to be a theme I'm going to have in there. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, um, you know, his, his relationship to the divine was definitely through his tummy, which is great. One way, mm. one manifestation of God. But when he started talking to me about seeing angels in the room as he was dying, and he even said to me, because I was always a little bit more woo-woo and open to some of those kinds of ideas. Sure. Um, he said, oh, my God, Lisa, there are angels there are angels in the rafters. Can you see them? And I said, no, but I believe you, daddy. And he said, uh, yeah. And then um, days before he died, he said, the angels tell me three days left, only three days. Uh, no one's to blame, three days left. And indeed, three days later, he passed away. So he obviously heard and saw something that was real. And so those you know, a variety of hearing fascinating, mythic, almost poetic language. Um, and then uh, also this kind of precognition, you know, with the visitor photo that I saw, you know, all of these things felt like I had entered a very different kind of zone than the ordinary, you know, the one that we ordinarily live in. Right. And after my dad passed, I went up the street to UC Berkeley. I was, um, you know, that's where I went to school. And I went to the linguistics department to find out um, all the writing they were going to have about people's language as they die, because, you know, we collect tons of information, obviously, about language acquisition, right? We know about, right. language, you know, so I figured there was going to be some material about the unraveling of language and what kind of patterns. And I was stunned to see there was really nothing. And when I brought it up to some of my old professors, like George Lakoff, who's a wonderful uh, linguist, specializes in metaphor, <clears throat> he kind of looked at me a little queasily, like, well, we don't really, <laughs> you know, we, we tend not to study the language of dying people. <laughs> we study dying languages, but we don't. Sure. <laughs> right. Completely different. <laughs> so, um, so a light went in, light bulb went on, and I was just, um, again, I, at the time I was just uh, a teacher, not just, but I was a teacher, and you know, I, I never really dove that deeply into these questions, but it seemed like it was an area that you know, really begged to be researched. So I began this journey, and indeed, my dad, um, Monday will be the 10-year anniversary of my father's passing. Wow. So it's actually been a decade now that I've been doing this work and um, I'm just so grateful. I mean, it was, you know, I'm, of course, I'm sorry I lost my father, but it was really um, a, a great blessing and a gift to me. And I think I've carried on his legacy because he loved language. And so, yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing and my deepest condolences. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Uh, my mother's anniversary of her passing will be one year on Sunday. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's um, still fresh. It's still different. And um, trying to learn how to navigate life without my best friend has been quite oh, challenging. I'm really sorry. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. yeah. 
So you were able to take some of this, I would surmise, pain and anguish and things, but you found this wonderful outlet that you were able to continue on with, it seems like. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I really, it really was. And because my father loved language, it felt like a way of keeping him alive. You know, and I think that's one thing that we can do when we have profound losses. And if we're close to our parents, which some of us are, are lucky because, you know, are fortunate. Some people don't have those right. kinds of connections with their parents. Um, but, you know, I really felt like I was carrying on his legacy in a certain kind of way, that the work that I was doing really was in honor because he's the one who really awakened in me a love for language. And I don't know why this, I'm getting a story in my mind. I'm just free associating. But I remember when I was like a little itty bitty baby, like almost pre-verbal and, um, you know, I was just learning to speak and I was crying one night. My dad lit a match. And I remember him talking to me, you know, and making this connection about how words kind of brought light to things. And my father really gave me this feeling that, you know, words revealed a lot about who we were and how we are. And, and so, you know, Raymond is a highly, oh my gosh, my dad was a very abstract thinker. Um, and so, and my dad and I shared uh, this whole, you know, sharing abstract ideas together. And, um, and Raymond, you know, I really feel like sort of Raymond came along as a mentor, you know, at a time when I really felt the loss of my father. And we shared the kinds of conversations my father and I used to have, which are the very abstract question, you know, ones, the big questions. And I've also, you know, a little more concretely through Raymond, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people who've had near-death experiences. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I've just learned so much about, about, I mean, I just wouldn't have had the opportunity to talk to people so deeply and richly about what might happen after we die. And, and I am now convinced that something definitely, you know, consciousness continues in some way. Has there been any moment where maybe you've been talking with somebody, documenting something that it's given you a whole different perspective on what you might've thought like, okay, I feel like it's along these lines. And then all of a sudden there's something that just throws a curveball at you. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think at this point, um, I'm, I'm just going back in time when I was actually really involved with the active research because it, it's kind of quieted down. I'm still gathering data, but it's more like every three months I'll sit down and, and, and look. But, you know, it really was, I have to tell you, um, and again, not to be too personal here, but my mother is, um, has been dying this year. And, uh, and she really um, confused me. <laughs> and it was so humbling and, and as, as it should be. Uh, so I, so she called me, um, she was diagnosed with a terminal illness back in April. And she called me and um, sometime later, and she called me and she said, Lisa, um, I've got all these things that need to be packed up. She was using all the metaphors that I know are oftentimes associated with people getting ready to pass on. So mm. she used this language, you know, there are all these things I need to wrap up and I can't find the scotch tape. And can you come and help me find the sketch scotch tape? Cause I need to wrap up all these packages. Well, you know, she was completely bedridden in a, you know, in a hospice bed. There were no packages. It was all metaphor, sure. which is more common, which is what my book is about in part is the metaphors. So I was like, ah, oh, I know what's going on. <laughs> I am an expert now. <laughs> so I jump on the plane and, you know, dun, 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 dun. and, um, and, and yeah, she was to, pretty close to, to death. And she even told me at one point, she said she did not believe in God either. Never had this. At one point she announced to me, she had a first encounter with God and he described himself to be named. His name was Herb. So she told me I met Herb and he called me Suzela, you know, all this. And I was like, okay, you know, we're getting close to the threshold. And then 
something happened. My mother was discharged from hospice two weeks ago. And she's had this amazing recovery. And I was just told by the physical therapist yesterday that she thinks my mother's going to be out of bed and able to walk within four months. So again, I don't need to get too personal here because you're asking in a more abstract sure. you know, level about the things that surprised me in the research. But, you know, first we can never... You know, Raymond loves the word skeptic because in the ancient Greece, skeptical just means you keep an open mind and you keep reformulating your um, <laughs> your hypotheses and so forth. And so, you know, it's just we can never be too sure. Like, I really thought I knew what it all meant. And something happened in the process where she came very close to the threshold and she's back. And so now I'm kind of, it's actually shaped turning me around to really ask questions now about near-death experiences, but not when people actually die. But, you know, my mother was very close to the threshold and I learned a lot because some of her language was more like delirium. I learned a lot more about the difference between kind of delirious language and end of life language Mm -hmm. and demented language. You know, I really began to see some of the um, refinements and distinctions, but I think the main thing going back to your question is, oh my God, stay humble. You know, when it comes to death and dying, it's like we, the mystery is, is so big. Um, does that help? Does that offer some? Absolutely. absolutely. This is this is an open conversation. We're just conduits, <laughs> you know. <laughs> when you say there's like that distinction between some of that, you know, what some might consider maybe dementia, maybe someone might consider you know, early onset Alzheimer's or, you know, being at the threshold from what it sounds like you're saying, there's some indicators linguistically, at least that differentiate those. Yes. And um, yeah, there are, and I just want to go back one more minute because I'm sure. still processing your question about things that surprised me. And I want to just mention two things before we go on, because they, they tie into the answer. One is that, You know, I was really surprised. I had no idea about this whole notion of terminal lucidity. Um, Mm. And what terminal lucidity is, is someone can be completely non-lucid and non-verbal, non-responsive. And right before they die, they'll have this kind of brightening mentally and they'll have this uh, clarity of mind. And oftentimes the things they talk about uh, um, are really acts of kindness or forgiveness or statements of advice. So I had one person, the most dramatic case of this in my book, who, um, he was a friend of mine too, so he was a very trustworthy, you know, I know him well, I trust him. His mother um, had Alzheimer's for three years and was also in a coma. And she came out of the coma to tell him the exact location of where the financial folders were, all he needed to know to settle her estate. And she just, in this moment of clarity, was like, John, I want to let you know this material is in the study. It's in the third drawer down, right? And this is, you know, he hadn't heard really an intelligible phrase from her for years, um, truly. And then she came out of a coma. And then I became more interested in comas after that and and looked at uh, the research by Madeline Lawrence. And, you know, people who have been in, who have been comatose report hearing much more and being aware and also being tapped into, in some cases, uh, heightened sort of psychic abilities while they're in this state where everything else, their bodies look completely compromised, but there are sometimes even higher levels of communication or access to information than when our bodies are are whole and and intact. So I had to mention those because those were really surprising. So with my mother, you know, going back, my mother was in a state that seemed very comatose at one point. I mean, she wasn't speaking and was almost completely unresponsive. Hospice was telling me she had, you know, two to three days left at one point. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'll never forget, you know, the turnaround point, because it was so, so, Dramatic, and then I'll get back to what you asked about the dementia. So, you know, the different types of language. But she was in this comatose, you know, really state. And um, and I was just eating my lunch, as I often did, you know, with her. Um, and I had 
these grapes. I was eating grapes and I thought she was completely not really aware of me. And I, I don't know, I was probably saying, I, I was reading some near death experience accounts to her to try to comfort her about dying and, you know, just kind of whatever. And I thought, you know, but, you know, and suddenly she reaches her hand out to me. And I'm like, and she reached out more. And I think she said grapes or something. She you know, and I started giving her grapes, and she didn't stop eating them. She just kept eating these grapes. And uh, part of her illness that they were treat that that you know that they were treating her for that she's now in remission from was that she couldn't swallow very well. She couldn't. It hurt her. But she started eating these grapes, and then that was the turning point. When, wow. however. The difference in the language is that um, part of what got her to the state she was in is they did chemo and the steroids led to kind of a psychotic break, which unfortunately is not that uncommon. A woman over 70, the steroids can have a very negative effect on, on people. And so she was sort of psychotic and she, you know, the end of life language has this very kind of poetic and mythic and very metaphoric quality, you know, the M. And there's a sense that things are kind of moving along. Someone might say one night, oh, the train is waiting for me. And family members like, what the heck is grandpa talking about? And then three days later, you know, yeah, well, now the train, you know, is in the station. Let's get my bags packed. And you'll see this kind of narrative that has kind of an organic cohesion, right? Mm. But my mother, when... Um, she was sort of in this, you know, very demented, or I should say delirious state, uh, was very manic -y. Um, it, it didn't have that sense of cohesion and, and a kind of a poetic quality. You know, there were details. She wanted, she was, uh, it, it, there was a more of a random feeling. It was drawing more on the past than looking towards some kind of future. The dementia too, and these are just very early. I mean, the, I'm not making, I just want to let these just beginning observations, but I have noticed with language that's more demented, um, it's more regressive. It tends to refer back to the past, mm. uh, to childhood incidences or referring back to people or things in the past. Whereas end of life language, there are metaphors that seem to be moving us forward to another place. I need my passport. I'm getting ready for the big dance. Mm. So much so in sorrow, you know, speaking kind of to a, a, a pregnancy in the moment. So, um, and language that's just, you know, that affected by the meds can also have this sort of, there are hallucinations, but not visions. And um, yeah, um, let me see. Because some of the nurses I spoke to in hospice really talked about, you know, the difference between hallucinations and visions. And visions and end of life language and perceptions seem to have this sort of um, pacifying effect. Mm. It has a sense of centering people and putting them to peace, you know, where people might see visions of loved ones who are ushering them to the other side or what I perceive now as the other side. And many hospice nurses were saying where the vision, the hallucinations that might come from some of the meds, because definitely meds affect us. Sure. Oftentimes can be more agitating. And like my mother was talking a lot um, before she got into uh, early on in the language that I think of as more delirious and somewhat some of it demented about the care, the caretakers are trying to kill her oh. and they were out to get her. Okay. And, you know, um, they were putting her in a cage and it, when people are really close to the threshold, they've gone through that kind of terminal anxiety. And then there's a shift to, and not always, you know, I mean, obviously there are people who do die agitated, but I so I don't want to sugarcoat it, but sure. There tends to be this kind of shift to, you know, the old, what I call the, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow language, <laughs> which is how Steve Jobs died. And, you know, of course, is our greatest wish for the people we love. We hope, you know, and, it, and you know, that's what we want them all to see and say, of course, and it, but it's not always the case. I'm not going to, you know, say that. Do you mind if I ask about your mom or would you prefer not to? I, I don't mind at all. 
I would be curious about the language you heard in her final days. If you heard yeah. it. it was interesting because um, she had gotten ill and because of where we were with uh, at that time, uh, late 2020, we, she had gotten rushed to the hospital. So we weren't able to go see her or spend some time with her. So that was concerning to my father and myself and my brother. And so we were, I hate to say reduced, but we were reduced to just a telephone call. If we could get through to the room. Um, and if she was cognizant, you know, if she was able to take that call and there were a couple of times where my, my brother remembers talking to her and she had some, you know, some of those, I guess those hallucinations. And my mom loved children. My mom was a caregiver for so long for a lot of my cousins and family friends and took care of children all the time. And she would say that the, the kids were running through the halls and the kids were in the oh, room. It's very common. Right. And she was just like, you know, telling my brother that. And then there was that time, a period of time where she was worried that some of the folks that were taking care of her were out to get her. So that yeah. was very reminiscent of what you were saying. And then they had released her from the hospital and they felt that she needed a little rehabilitation for just a temporary time, but it immediately sent her back to the, the emergency room for some chest pains. She was there for a little bit. And then my father got the call that, you know, hospice was going to get involved. They were going to send her back to the house. So, um, and then we'd have a, a hospice nurse uh, at the house and set it up. But um, she was home for three days. Um, you know, we, we were all there when she came home. The last conversation I had with her on the telephone was right before she came home. <clears throat> and she was clear, whereas like some of the other conversations that we had had earlier, she wasn't very lucid. But this time, I, at the time, I was making a lot of candles during uh, the pandemic. I made candles and I asked my mother, I said, Mom, what, what's your favorite smell? Mm. And she said, lilacs. Wow. So I said, okay, I'm going to make a candle. So, and I did. I made many lilac candles. And um, so it was like the last full conversation that we could have um, where she told me she loved me and I loved her. And then again, you know, fast forward, she comes home. She wasn't really all there. And then we had her for about three days and um, she, she passed uh, my father right by her side, holding her hand and he woke up and she had passed and her hand and his hand were still together. They were together for 53 years married. And um, so it was a, a thing where I felt so, so happy that they were together with each other, you know, if it's going to happen, like, gosh, like what a, what a beautiful sentiment to that union. Um, so, yeah. And it was, it has been challenging for sure. You know, um, you know, full disclosure, you know, lots of therapy counseling, you know, doing things that you know are going to be beneficial for, for myself, um, and the people around me. So yeah, th that language was, again, very broken up, similar to what you were saying, where it was like, it went through the kind of spectrum of, of different emotions and feelings. Yeah, very interesting. And, you know, some of it might be the meds, but some of it is, you know, what I've heard from hospice nurses I've interviewed, and then I went, um, you know, is, you know, people, I mean, of course, our bodies, our physical beings are very, it's scary. I mean, our bodies are dying. We're, yeah. we're we want to live. We're biological beings, but it seems that something happens that then as we get closer, you know, and, and closer to the threshold for many of us, there's a kind of relaxation that sets in. And, and, and what my belief is that, you know, we're closer to what I call God or source and mm -hmm. there's more transcendental um, kind of awareness and, and, and the language shifts too. But um Oh, well, I'm sorry. And, and, um, you know, I, um, you know, my thought is, I, I just had this, you know, working on a book, you know, that with a psychic medium right now, but, um, you know, I wonder if you'll smell lilac. Have you smelled lilacs this year? At all? I mean, I did when spring rolled around. Um, it was obviously in the air, literally and figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was, it was fascinating because it was, it reminded me of her instantly, but also I, had a period of time where it was, you know, within the first week of her passing. And it was just one of those things where I, I had a sweatshirt and a, uh, like a flannel t-shirt of hers. And I happened to be um, in the basement of, of the house I was living in at the time. And uh, I just remember moving them. And then in that moment, feeling her presence, like literally feeling like I'm, she's standing with me. It was mm -hmm. just, 
And I'll never, ever forget that feeling Mm -hmm. ever. (laughs) It's so powerful. Yeah. It's, I, 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 I mean, I've, you know, spoken to many people in conversation about uh, the kind of what happens after people die or well, during their dying. And some of them have been family members. And I have one family member who, before her husband died, you know, didn't believe in any of this very scientifically trained and understandably, you know, until you have any really powerful experience, it's, you, you know, it's rational to question these things. Mm. Um, and she had that very strong sense too of her husband one day. And it, it you know, it's so funny because it's invisible. You know, you can't, but when you've had that experience, and I've spoken to so many people, it just changes you. And you can't, it's like love. Like try to explain that love exists. <laughs> you know, especially. Right. <laughs> but but once you've felt it, you know that it's the real deal. So I, you know, I, I so I'm glad you get that experience and that you you know, that, you know, that she's with you. Cause I, you know, I do believe that, um, you know, I've grown to really believe, especially in the last 10 years that our ancestors are with us and not, you know, and to, and to walk through life with an open heart, expecting that to be so, and, and it seems to happen. So anyway, thank you for sharing that. I, I, you know, it's funny. I, that's the other thing. And this is something Raymond has really inspired me. You know, the guy has been doing this research for 50 years. Right. And he's still excited and curious about these things. And I'm, I'm finding myself the same way because it's um, there's so many layers to it. And, um, and we have to be able to talk about these things together because, you know, death is, loss is devastating. You know, there's yeah. just no way around it. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, we think about it, you know, culturally how, you know, different the different peoples of the world and how they go about, you know, taking care of or remembering their ancestors or, you know, even the preparation of, of passing and what it means to them and their culture and their belief system. Do do you find uh, between some of the folks or some of the research you've done in the past, uh, a lot of the congruence between different maybe belief systems that there's like a lot of the same threads that run through that? Mm, well, that's a great question. You know, I don't know if I know about enough belief systems to answer that. So I'll answer it kind of in two parts. One is, you know, I have gotten cross linguistic and cross cultural samples from people, and it's pretty amazing. This metaphor of taking a trip, where people talk about trips, seems to be from everything I've gotten. Is this seems to be a metaphor that exists in the dying words of people around the world? This this idea of some kind of trip we're all taking together. And, you know, I think when you look at some of the practices and the burial practices of different cultures at different times, and again, I know not enough, but I know a little, you know, sometimes people, you know, bury people with things for the trip to the afterlife. I mean, there's been indications around the world that people believe that we were going somewhere. And, And when you look at sort of the euphemisms and the way people talk about death and dying, oftentimes it involves some kind of trip and passing on or, you know, that so on. Um, yeah, let, let me think. You know, I do think that we are not ceremonial in every aspect of our lives, you know, from eating dinner um, to, um, to burying our dead. And I'm Jewish and um We had someone do the ritual cleaning of my, you know, we had a group of men from the temple do the ritual cleaning and and we sat around and said prayers and sang together and I was doing Shiva, which is, you know, every night people get together and share meals and, um, and stories about, you know, we shared stories about my father and, you know, even I had a, a very, uh, my marriage ended a few years ago. And um, just yesterday, um, I buried one piece of clothing that I had kept from my ex. I had held on to it all this time. <laughs> I couldn't let it go. <laughs> and yesterday, um, it was Valentine's Day synchronistically, but um, Yesterday, I got some roses and I felt ready, not with a, with anger or anything, but just with ceremony um, to to essentially bury it, you know, to, to say it, it was done. But it took me almost three years to do that. I um, and I knew I would have to. So, 
You know, we've got to have more ceremony for loss. I mean, a lot of research in cancer, what I've heard is that oftentimes cancer onset is, I read somewhere with the Simonton, anyway, like 18 months after profound losses. Um, you know, many times you'll see cancer emerge when people, especially when people don't let themselves, you know, fully feel the loss. So, you know, loss affects us very, very profoundly. And that's, you know, it's been terrible with COVID, you know, as a, as a culture, we've all been, I think, mourning on so many losses. I mean, like we're definitely in the throes of, you know, post-traumatic or, you know, just PTSD, all of us. And like, God bless, I'm so grateful and so relieved to hear that you got to have your mom at home. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I just can't imagine. I mean, for all the people who are listening who have had to um, say goodbye without being able to say goodbye, I just my heart, my heart breaks for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Same. And I, it's it's weird to try and not weird, but you, know, you look at it, it's all about perspective and looking at this you know, situation our family was presented with, but feeling grateful that she, if she did have to pass, it was in the comforts of her own home. You know luckily with her husband right by her side. And, you know, I know that that's ultimately what she would have wanted, you know, and uh, when we were kids, we would talk about things and I'd get so upset. Mom, don't talk like that. Oh, you know, someday I'm not going to be here. <laughs> you know, and biggest fear since I was a child, but you, know, you, you have to, you know, have to, you know, go head on. And the only way through it is through it. And you can't go around it. You've just got to, you know, move through it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's funny because I was a lot more afraid of death and dying. And my father father was one of these people. He was terrified. I remember going on airplanes with my dad and he used to have to drink so much. I mean, he would get so loaded. I mean, I remember one day he was so, I don't know. Well, his dad is okay. <laughs> sure. I, think he, I, mean, this is, I mean, I'll never forget this because I was 12 years old and I was just mortified. My dad got so drunk because it was so terrifying the plane. He said to me, Lisa, isn't life amazing? Just think, my sperm and your mom's over. We created you. Life is just, and he started ranting on the plane about how life is made. And I was like, oh my God, my 12 year old self, I was like falling under the seats. Anyway, but that's how afraid my dad, my dad was, you know, of death and dying. I mean, airplanes, right. was, um, because he would, he would just drink himself silly and he went do that, you know, when he was on earth. Um, <laughs> oh, my Lord. Oi, oi, oi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> too good. <laughs> but what happened to me through doing this research, Dr. Kenneth Ring, who's one of the premier uh, researchers in the field of near-death experiences, talked about um, for researchers, there's this benign virus that you catch. And what the benign virus is, is that when you work with people who've had near-death experiences and who no longer fear death, I mean, I mean the, the majority of people who've had NDEs come back from the near-death experience and say, there's nothing to fear. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, it was a magnificent and amazing experience for many. I mean, I think it's like three to 8% of people had more you know, difficulties but the majority of people are talking about these remarkable, you know, um, kind of vivid, uh, you know, high definition color, um, just, you know, one light beings. I mean, just remarkable kinds of experiences. And what Ken Ring talked about is, you know, after you research dozens, if not hundreds, or in Raymond's case, even thousands of people around the world, and you hear about these near death experiences they've had, um, it's, you really do lose your fear. I mean, Raymond certainly has no fear of dying. He said he's much more, you know, Raymond talks about being much more afraid of life than he is of death. <clears throat> and I, um, and I think one of the, I mean, I believe me, I'm, you know, I mean, you know, during COVID, I'm, I've been very, you know, really afraid. You know, I mean, I'm not saying I'm just running around like, whatever, <laughs> not at all, not at all, not at all. <laughs> you know, I am, and mostly I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of pain. Mm. It actually, be honest, uh, more than that than death. But you know, you hear people come back from these near death experiences, um, the, whose lives were so profoundly changed. And you know, we talk about like someone like Dr. Evan Alexander, who's a neuroscientist who wrote this book, Proof of Heaven. Man, this is not some woo woo weirdo, right? This is a guy who 
really had a profound experience, who's a deeply thinking and analytical and rational mind, who was transformed by this sort of light-filled spiritual experience where he saw a sister he didn't even know he had, you know, and I mean, all these remarkable things. So for me, and what a blessing of what I've done is, you know, this work I've done is I've heard these stories. And so, you know, I feel going through my mother's death was or dying or this whole process has been very different than when I went to my dad's dying. I mean, I remember while my dad was dying, I didn't even want to use the word dying. Hmm. So I was just like, I thought if I said it, I would make it happen somehow. Right. Right. But with my mom, I, you know, I brought in these NDE accounts. I read her things. We talked about going to the light and opening up to the light and, you know, we did sort of these beautiful meditations together when she was feeling most afraid. And again, I'm, I'm not sugarcoating it. There were nights that she was really, really, really afraid. Sure. And, um, but for me, at least as someone by her side, you know, when I was with my dad, I was afraid most of the time. And there were so many things he said that now I wished I had asked him about, but I didn't even want to like talk about it death and dying with him. And, you know, I wonder if partially why my mother's done so well to the hospice was that, you know, we had these incredible conversations about death and dying and the light and tapping into to the light and stuff. But um, so I think for myself, I, you know, again, I, uh, you know, I'm not afraid. I, I, then I inherited my dad's fear of flying, of course. And, <laughs> So I started doing this research, I had a very different feeling about it because you really, um, you know, once you hear these accounts from people, it's, you know, just incredible. And then more and more doctors are sharing experience they're having, you know, Jeff O'Driscoll and Jeff Olson. Um, Dr. O'Driscoll was in the emergency room when this guy comes in, had this horrible car accident. His wife, unfortunately, did not survive. And, um, I believe one of the children uh, also didn't make it. And the doctor himself saw the apparition. Again, not a woo-woo weirdo. This is, right. you know, a physician and a you know, highly trained. He saw the apparition of this man's wife. Um, so we're hearing more now about shared death experiences. And when you start talking about shared death, when someone who's not going through the dying process, then you have to say, this is not hypoxia. This doesn't have to do with, you know, lack of oxygen. This is not the meds. There is something else going on. And um, Raymond and I are going to be doing um, a, a webinar in March, March 12th, <laughs> with William Peters, <laughs> who just wrote this book um, published by Simon & Schuster called it Heaven's Door. And he's done extensive research into shared death experiences, like the one I just described, where, you know, people describe being near people who are dying and themselves experiencing these sort of transcendental um, experience, you know, occurrences, uh, you know, some people even say they shared the near death, the life review, which mm. is a component of the near death experience where you go through your life and see all the things that happen to you through the perspective of other people through the eyes of others. Gotcha. So, you know, there are reports now that people are actually sharing those kinds of occurrences now. So if that's happening, you know, we know that consciousness is, is not here, you know, consciousness lives outside of us somehow. Um, I had an experience with my dad when he was dying before I even knew about all these things. Mm. And I was in Napa, living in Napa. My dad was living in Berkeley and I would come after work and visit him. And um, I was sleeping and at 3.15 in the morning, I, could, I just couldn't sleep. And then I had that, that um, feeling that you were describing with your, with your mother. I felt presences in the room, you know, just like you were explaining. It's an energetic thing. It's hard to explain. Right. You really, it's like, there are, there's someone in the room with me right now. Right. And, um, and I remember the red on the, you know, I remember clearly on the clock and it was 3.15 and I woke up my husband at the time, we we're still married, and I said, I'm feeling like presences in the room. I wonder if my mom's dying or I wonder what's going on. And of course, he was like, honey, go back to sleep. <laughs> I got a long work day tomorrow. So I went back to sleep. 
And um, the next day I went to go visit my dad as I did every day after work. And uh, so I said to my mom, you know, how's everything going with that? She said, well, you know, the weirdest thing happened about 3.15 in the morning. He woke up and he said that he felt all these people in the room with him. And he told her, um, and was, hold on, I just want to get the, tell all these people, something like tell these people, I have no time for them. I can't talk with everyone. Or, you know, he was sort of complaining. I can't remember the exact words. I haven't written, I think, in my, somewhere I've written up. But, you know, but it was, again, that he was talking about, I don't have time for all these people, something like that. Um, but yeah, David Kessler in his book, uh, uh, I think it's called Crowded Rooms or something, talks about how common it is when people are dying and they have this nearing death awareness, they talk about crowded rooms, right? They talk about, about, about that. So there are so many things when you start looking at all the puzzle pieces and all the books out there, it's really hard not to believe that something continues and that we're not alone. Um, so I hope just on a personal level, that might give you some comfort in knowing that your mom is probably right there with you right now. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Hanging out with her. <laughs> she is. I carry her with me always. You know, that's, yeah, that's amen. amen. Yeah. She's wonderful. Uh, she's, I could never say enough good stuff about my mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you mind if I ask what her name is or would you rather not? Sure, sure. Uh, Rosalind. Rosalind. All right. All right. Rosalind. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. And uh, so she, uh, she's, uh, gosh. Yeah. Even, uh, even when I was, uh, even when I was born, quick anecdotal thing. So my mother, when she was born, my grandmother didn't have a middle name picked out for her. They just didn't. So as it goes, they needed something. So my grandmother just put the letter J down as my mother's middle name. For years, my mom didn't have a middle name until my mom decided to choose a middle name for herself legally. So fast forward, I'm her second son. She had no idea. She thought she was going to have a girl. I was a boy. So I come out and she's like, I don't have a name for this one. So she had a girl's name picked out, but not a boy's name. So they said, okay, well, you need a name. She says, well, let's put the letter J for now. Love and it. I'll figure out a name. <laughs> so, so she spent the first few hours with me just looking at me and she already had my middle name picked out. It's going to be David. She knew that that was a beyond the shadow of a doubt. She's like, that's easy. It's David. I said, oh, so then she, she looked at me and she said, you're my son. You're Jay, Jason. So, Ooh, wow. so it ended up, ended up that way. So oh, that's lovely, Jason. yeah, it's lovely. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, she was great. She was great. Wonderful, wonderful person. Wow. Now, with your book, Words at the Threshold, um, where can folks find that? They can find it on Amazon, uh, easy enough. And um, I just found it. It was just published in France also. So if you're in France, by any chance, you can buy it there now in French. Um, and also, if you want to come to the finalwordsproject.org uh, website where I collect the research, <clears throat> you can, um, if you have anything to share, there's a submission form to share your stories. And there's also a free excerpt of the book if you'd rather not buy it and just check it out first um, oh, wow. before you purchase it. That's so. awesome. Uh, yeah. Any new upcoming projects? Any other stuff coming up? Thank you for asking. Um, I am working on another book about this whole process with my mother, and um, I'm calling it Healing at the Threshold. Oh, I love that. Yeah, so we'll see. Um, I'm excited. And so if anyone has any stories of kind of remarkable recoveries, and also the other piece I'm interested in is people who uh, have reconciliations or periods of, of healing as their loved ones are dying in those last months about how that time can be really precious to heal old wounds, which is something else that happened in the last uh, time with my mother in the last seven to eight months. So please contact me at finalwordsproject.org or lifeafterlife.com if you are, have stories to share that way too. Big question though. We're going to end the podcast this way. All righty. Most important question you're going to have. Uh-oh. What's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. I'm going to have a lentil meatloaf. Ooh. Wow. Ah. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. <laughs> right on. Well, good. I, I hope you enjoy it thoroughly. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for doing this. I honestly am honored. I'm humbled. Um, I'm so grateful. So thank you so much. You too, you. You be well. And there you have it. I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with Lisa. I uh, was able to share some real personal stories with Lisa and all of you. Lisa also shared some real personal stories with all of us. I can't thank you enough for your time and your energy. There's always so many questions in our minds when we lose the people we love. Maybe that's why I started this. If you'd like to find out more about the research that Lisa has been doing with Dr. Raymond Moody, be sure to check out lifeafterlife.com as well as if you have any of your stories you'd like to share, you can go to finalwordsproject.org. And again, really looking forward to Lisa's upcoming book, but I would strongly implore each and every one of you to check out Lisa's book, Words of the Threshold, What We Say When We're Nearing Death. Thank you all so much for joining us on this episode. If you like this episode, please give us a rating. If you're watching, we hope you subscribe to the channel, hit that like button, and hit that notification bell so you can find out about new episodes as they come out. Thank you all so much. And until next time, take care of one another and keep thinking for yourself. <laughs>